Well, good morning, church. It is a joy to be with you this morning. What a great message of worship we've already had. And I can't think of a better song to sing at Christmas time than Amazing Grace. On behalf of Pastor Dave and the rest of our staff team, we do want to wish you and your family a very Merry Christmas. It's going to be a joy to open up God's Word with you this morning. And so I invite you to find your copy. Uh, as we'll be kind of all over the place a bit this morning, but I hope that you'll enjoy our time together because I hope it's an encouragement to you, not only for this season, but for the year ahead. You know, the Bible speaks of this birth of Jesus coming in Luke chapter 2, verse 14. It says, glory to God in the highest and on earth, peace, goodwill towards men. The angels are harking, giving a message to the world that there is peace coming. Goodwill is coming, and because of that, we should give glory to God in the highest. Over the Christmas break, my family loves to do puzzles. In fact, just last night, they went to the store and grabbed new puzzles. And we all have our method to our madness and how we put a puzzle together. Some people may put the edges together. Others will put the box up, t up top and be able to kind of look at the photo they're trying to put that puzzle together for. Either way, People love puzzles. And of course, at the very end of that puzzle, there's this great uh, opportunity to take that last puzzle piece and complete the picture. I don't know if you're like my family, sometimes that last piece has gone AWOL. And it may be on the floor, it may be left in the box, but we can't find that last piece. And inevitably, we're saying, where is the piece? And typically, it's some little brother or maybe someone else just holding on to that last piece because they want the satisfaction of completing the puzzle. And I think it's a great question we all probably ask at one point in our life, where is the peace? The little play on words there reminds us that in our world today, there is war. So where's the peace? There's fighting, there's conflict, there's injustice, there's pain, there is suffering. And truthfully, pain is everywhere. And in some way, pain touches everyone. So where's the peace on earth? Where is the goodwill towards men? And we want to ask that question, where's the peace? Maybe another question might be, what is the peace? As the angels hark, they speak of the peace who is coming. This one's name is Jesus. I think about trying to define what peace is, and I think about what peace isn't. Uh, peace certainly is not war. It's not chaos. Uh, it's disorder, it's not commotion, it's not turmoil, it's not drama, and that may sound like your family Christmas dinner, I'm not sure, but peace is something that we're all longing for, but certainly in a world where there is suffering, often we can't see it. Listen, I think it's so ironic that we think about peace at this time of year because we remember the words of Luke 2, that goodwill and peace should be coming to the earth. But truthfully, Christmas time is one of the most busiest, one of the most chaotic times of the year. And so as we finish our series, More to the Story, we've been discussing this Christmas time. We've been discussing what does it mean to have Jesus come to the earth. Isaiah, over 700 years prior to Jesus' birth, speaks of his coming. And in Isaiah 9, 6, he tells us that there is going to be a child who is born, a son who is given, whose name will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, He'll be the Prince of Peace. And we've been unlocking some truths behind these different names, and, and it's been a great series to look at. And today I want to speak about this Prince of Peace. What does it mean when Isaiah spoke these words that the Prince of Peace is coming? As we celebrate Christmas, I think we have to look into this reality. And Isaiah provides some clarity for us. He, he speaks of Jesus as a prince. Well, what does that mean? He's a representative of the king. He has power and authority. It's got a, a military tone to it. It's, it's one who has control over something. And so as a prince, Isaiah is seeing and saying that Jesus has control over this peace. The Hebrew word for prince of peace is shar shalom. Shar being the word prince, and shalom being a word we, you may even know, it means to bring peace. It means to, to have uh, an idea of a state of health or good welfare, uh, friendliness, even a delivery, a security about you. So when you speak shalom over someone, you are speaking peace over someone. When Isaiah says shar, shalom, he is saying there is one who is coming and he will secure all 
peace. In fact, he will remove all the peace-disturbing realities and just bring peace. And when Isaiah speaks of Shar Shalom, he's speaking to, to Jesus, and he's recording his title giving us an understanding of what his job is to do. He will obtain, achieve, he will enact peace, he will bring peace to humankind. And so this Christmas Eve, when we speak of Prince of Peace, we need to remember this is what Jesus has come to do. And so this morning, there are three simple realities about peace that I want us to consider. Jesus brings peace with God. Jesus brings peace with God. The greatest chaos in our world isn't necessarily what's happening in the Middle East or communist countries. It's not necessarily in Israel. It's not among the drug cartels or or terror cells. It's it's not even among your toddlers or your grandkids uh, around the Christmas break. The greatest chaos is this reality that it's much more cosmic than you realize. For it's about humankind and the disunity against our Savior our God. Romans 5 says that man is an enemy of God. That in Romans 8 reminds us that we as men were once all hostile to God. You see, the greatest need for peace in the universe is for man to be at peace with God. And Jesus' birth is the gateway to that kind of peace. Just as sin entered the world through Adam, sin is conquered. Peace comes through the work and the person of Jesus. Listen to Romans chapter 5, and Paul writes in verse 18, Therefore, as one trespass leads to condemnation for all men, so one act of righteousness leads to justification and life for all men. For as by one man's disobedience the many were made sinners, so by one man's obedience the many will be made righteous. Jesus does the work to eradicate the hostility between man and God. Paul in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 14, speaks of this. He says, For he himself, speaking of Jesus, is our peace, who has made us both one and has broken down the flesh, the dividing wall of hostility. Jesus breaks down the wall of opposition and enmity between man and between God. He is the pathway to God. He's removed the obstacle of sin And I think it's important that we think about this truth, that at one point we were all divided from God. And Jesus comes and he breaks down that wall. And he's the only one who can do it. Jesus brings peace with God. Romans chapter 5 verse 1 speaks of this. It says, since through Christ we've been justified by faith, we have peace. We have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. You know, it's interesting that in our sinful state, we, again, we were once enemies with God. But the Bible says, just a few verses later, Romans chapter 5, verse 8, but God demonstrates his own love towards us, that while we were still yet sinners, Christ died for us. And so because of Christ's sacrifice, we were restored in a relationship, and that relationship is bound by peace with the Lord. This is the deep abiding peace that happens in our hearts And it cannot be taken away. It's the ultimate fulfillment of what Jesus came to do as the Prince of Peace. And so this Christmas season, I I believe this. I'm not just saying it. I, I really believe this. Christmas is mainly Mary because in Jesus, our Prince, he brings peace with God. Not only does he bring peace with God, but Jesus brings peace with others. As the as the bringer of peace. He resides in us as believers. Therefore, we are then ambassadors of that peace. We have the ability to become peacemakers, to become peacekeepers. And you see, without the peace of God, we'll never really have peace with others. There's this vertical reality that always impacts the horizontal reality, that me with him is going to impact help me or hurt me with others. As I'm right with God in a vertical sense, that I'll be right with God are right with others in a horizontal sense. I think one of the biggest issues we have in our culture today is this one of division. There's cultural division, and there's spiritual and political division. There's division around justice issues related to race or, or gender ideology. There's spiritual division around considerations that related to marriage and or family. Um, political division on who's right or who's on the left. Even among our churches, there's denominational division about biblical authority or even women in leadership there is division all over the place but the gospel 
brings unity because Jesus brings peace. And it's not just peace in an abstract way, but it's peace in a very practical way. And here's how he does that. He does that through you and I. That in the midst of our division, we as believers in Christ are put into those places of division, not to sow discord, but rather become peacemakers. Because we have peace in us, peace can come from us to others. As carriers of the peace, we're like antibodies that are being sent out into the realities of sin and discord and, and disunity. And our heartbeat is that peace that comes from within would go to out to others. And this is what Paul, I think, has in mind when he speaks to the church of Colossae in Colossae chapter 3, verses 12 and following. He says, put on then as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, compassionate hearts, put on kindness and humility and meekness and patience, bearing with one another, and if anyone has complaint against another, forgiving each other, as the Lord has forgiven you, so that you may also forgive. And above all of these things, put on love, which binds everything together in perfect harmony. Verse 15, and let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts. Now, I think Christmas is a call to let the peace of Christ rule in our hearts. And as it does, it changes how we treat others, and it changes our culture. And, and here's my hope. My hope is that as we let the rule of the peace of Christ rule in our hearts, that the community around us as the church will know what we're for more than they'll know what we're against. So often we as Christians want to dispute and argue and debate against the other side, and in doing so, we can be guilty of creating a lot of division and a lot of disunity. And I think we can stand for righteousness and we can stand for godly principles while at the same time creating opportunity for conversations and dialogue. But that only happens as we are constantly seeking to let peace rule in our hearts. So often we get into a conversation and it's about who's right or who's wrong. And we forget that we're, we're closing the doors to relationship when we wanted to debate rather than just discuss and let the peace of Christ come out in those conversations. Matthew 10 kind of speaks of a, of a different reality. And I may sound contradictory just for a moment. Matthew 10, Jesus says, I came not to bring peace, but to bring a sword. And thinking about that, it sure does. Say, How can Jesus, who's the Prince of Peace, bring peace? And then later on say, I didn't come to bring peace, but to bring a sword. What Jesus is saying is there's going to come a time in everyone's life when you're going to have to commit. You're going to have to trust God and his principles and the scripture. And you can't do your thing and also follow God's way and be at peace. There's going to come a conflict. And so the call to commitment is like a sword. It's, it's, it's a call to action where you've got to sever your own way and follow the Lord. And as we think about Christ, as we think about how he loved and helped people, we need to remember that Jesus always called sin, sin. Always. But he also loved people compassionately, and he cared for them, even though they were in the midst of sin. What we don't see Jesus do is debate people and cast them down. Rather, he's always thoughtful about lifting them up, always thoughtful about calling them, not just to be right or wrong, not just to identify their wrongness, but he's calling them to identify that God loves for them, God's got a plan and purpose and plan, a per, plan and purpose for them, and God's called them into an action. That action is a relationship that only happens as we allow the peace of God to rule in those conversations. So if you're in conflict with someone else right now, this Christmas season, can I just invite you to let the peace of Christ that you already have rule itself in your life, that as you're loving others, as you're in relationship with others, as you're talking, as you're having those family dinners and those Christmas parties with other things, allow that peace to permeate your conversation, your attitude, your countenance, how you treat and how you love others. When you do that, glory to God in the highest will take place. So Jesus comes to bring peace with God, peace with others, and I think he also comes to bring peace with self. One of my favorite movies of late is Kung Fu Panda. Now, if you have kids, you know this movie, and if you don't have kids, well, just humor me just for a second. Po is a panda, and he's been destined to become the most unlikely hero uh, who will learn Kung Fu to save his animal friends in this valley against the criminal Tai Lung, who's a, a snow leopard. Now, as you think about it, a snow leopard should be able to defeat a panda, 
but that's the point of the movie. We see something very different. Now, Poe the Panda is uh, being taught and led by a kung fu master who's a little high strung. That kung fu master, his name is Master Shifu. And he's got the impossible task of trying to teach this overweight, bumbling panda the art of kung fu so that he can defeat Tai Lung. Now, Master Shifu is just anxious and he's uptight throughout the entire movie and he's just kind of overwhelmed by this giant task. And he's found in the movie early one morning trying to achieve and concentrate so that he can receive inner peace. And after Poe finally defeats Tai Lung, oh, by the way, if that's a spoiler for you, the movie's been out 15 years, so I'm not going to apologize for that. But Shifu achieves inner peace. And while he's there receiving inner peace, Poe comes and lays down next to him, and, and after a moment, he interrupts this inner peace and asks Shifu if he can go get something to eat. Now, it's kind of comical. And before you send me an email about Eastern mysticism and, and inner peace, I think we need to realize that Shifu is an example of the human experience that we as humans all want to receive in some way inner peace. Jesus can bring us inner peace. He, he does that through something that we all have, something yet we all struggle with, and, and something that if we give, but we often hold on so tightly to, we, we, we can't let go of this one thing so tightly that the vein in your neck or your forehead begins to, you know, creep up. Maybe you, you're stressed out and there's all this tension and, and, and maybe you're even so exhausted as you hang on to this one thing that can bring you inner peace. Let me get to that in a second. I've got an acrylic board in my office and it's clear and occasionally I'll write to-do lists on this board or other priorities or other things I need to remember and this board just sits offset of where my computer is. So as I'm typing on my computer, I can just lift my head and see this board and it, it's a great reminder of things that I should be doing or, or things that I need to get accomplished. And that's pretty intentional of where that board is. And so because of that, I often write passages of scripture that God brings to my heart and mind that I want to remember through a week or a month or a season in my life. In October, I was feeling pretty overwhelmed with our renovation project. We were raising money, and the Lord had done a great work in, in helping you commit to next steps. But then we were, we were digging out the, the stage. We were, uh, we were taking out the bathrooms. We were digging, pushing everything away to, to stud walls. I mean, it was just a lot. And I was feeling a bit overwhelmed with all that was taking place and, and all that it would cost and hoping that it would come together soon and, and timely. So I had a lot of stress, a lot of anxiety in my life. And the Lord gave me a passage that I wrote on my board to kind of be an anchor of hope and uh, really just be at a place of peace and calmness in the midst of this chaotic time. So in October, I wrote these words, Isaiah chapter 22, verses 3 and 4. You keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on you. Because he trusts you. Trust in the Lord forever, for the Lord your God is an everlasting rock. You know, peace has a name, and the way to that peace is through trust. Yet so often when we hang on so tightly, we are unwilling to let go of some of that trust and trust the Lord. I want to remind you of what the scripture says. You keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on you because he trusts you. You know, we live in a world where we are so thoughtful about all the other things going on and we allow that anxiety and that stress to really kind of overwhelm us. Maybe this Christmas season, your gift to the Lord is trust. And you'll find that as you begin to trust him, you'll begin to achieve inner peace. This idea that you're at rest, this idea that God is in control and you don't have to be, this idea that you can find yourself at a place of, of harmony with your own heart and mind, and that happens as we trust the Lord. Trust brings inner peace, and it could be that maybe you're struggling this Christmas season because you've not trusted the Lord in ways he's asked you to. So I would just encourage you, if you want the gift of Christmas this season, trust, let go and trust the Lord, and he will do a wonderful work in your life. 2 Thessalonians 3.16 is a great reminder of this truth. May the Lord of peace himself give you his peace at all times. In every situation, the Lord be with you all. Peace I, live with you, peace I leave with you. Peace I give you. I do not give as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled, and do not be afraid. John 14.27. The Prince of Peace comes at Christmas 
And that's why we celebrate. If you called me J. Mill, I would know that you're one of my students from a former ministry in Texas. Now, if you called me Hey Greek, I would know that you're a college friend. My closest friends call me Miller, but only four people in all the world call me Dad. And when I hear that name, I immediately perk up and I do all I can to serve them. As we've kind of walked through the names of Jesus, we've realized names are important. And I think as we're thinking about Christmas Eve and tomorrow being Christmas morning, what name are you trusting the Lord with this season? Is it Wonderful Counselor? Is it Mighty God? Is it Everlasting Father? Is it Prince of Peace? No matter what name you lean into, can I just ask you to receive the name of the Lord? And in doing so, the Bible tells us in John 1, 9 through 12, that those who receive him will be called the children of God. The greatest gift you can give Jesus this Christmas season is your heart and salvation. And so I invite you, as we pray together in just a moment, to open up your mind, your heart, trust in the Lord, whether it be in salvation or the conflict or the pain or the, the problem that's going on in your life this Christmas season. Either way, we get to emulate what the, what the angel said in Luke 2, glory to God in the highest. Let's pray together. Father, by your great name and by your grace, we just want to say thank you for Christmas. I thank you for the opportunity to open up God's word and and to consider the scriptures that remind us of the peace that you bring, the peace that you are. And in that reality, you embody and give us the ability to bring peace to others, peace to the world. And so, Father, I'm so grateful for that. Allow the opportunities in front of us, whether it be this week or even tomorrow and Christmas Day, to be pre peacemakers, to be peacekeepers. And Father, I pray that as we consider what the Prince of Peace means to us, we'd be very, very thoughtful about what the Prince of Peace means to the world around us. There are those here this morning, Lord, as they're hearing the words of my voice who are struggling with inner peace, just have turmoil and calamity in their own life and just tension. Father, I pray that they would learn to trust you. And I, I love the scriptures that just remind us that you bring us peace as we trust you. Certainly peace for every day, but certainly peace for eternity as we trust you in salvation. And so, Lord, I ask for those who this morning need the prayer, need the help, need the encouragement of a pastor or a friend. Father, I pray that they don't keep quiet about their need, but speak that need to others. And that, Lord, you would bring people around them to respond and be helpful. Lord, I'm so grateful for our church. I'm grateful for the word. I'm grateful for this season. And Lord, as we think about you, may you bring glory to yourself through us and your church. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.